Mm -hmm. Okay, Gabriela, I'm going to turn it over to you, okay? Awesome, great, thank you. So hi everyone, it's such a pleasure to be here and to share my work with you. Um, are you currently seeing the slide where you can see me as a little kid eating ice cream? Yes? Okay, great. <laughs> well, as Joe already said, my name is Gabriela Baez. My pronouns are she, they. I am a Puerto Rican photographer based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I recently graduated with an anthropology degree from the University of Puerto Rico and have been photographing since 2017. And it's both a struggle and an adventure to work as an image worker or lens-based worker in the Caribbean. But today I'm gonna to share with you the story of Ojalá Nos Encontremos en el Mar, um, the project titled, Hopefully We'll Meet at Sea, about my father's suicide in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And before I continue with the presentation, I want to give a content warning. I'll be talking about natural disasters, depression, trauma, and suicide. If these topics are triggering or particularly sensitive to you, please take all the necessary precautions to take care of your mental health and or take space whenever you may need it. I'd also like to invite you all to annotate any questions so that we can discuss them in the end. I want to highlight that even though this is a very personal project, there is no question uncomfortable enough or too taboo to be asked as long as it is done with respect. So part of my intention with this project is to provoke conversations about suicide and mental health with honesty and vulnerability. So hopefully we'll meet at sea is a journey it's a quest for answers. It's the process to find my father, look for access to him in some way. It's the desire to want him back. It's moving between healing and depression, life and death. And it's my way of telling those responsible of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria that I don't forget and that we will never forget. It's more than anything, this project, a love letter to my father, Jorge Baez, with all his contradictions and humanity. So on September 20th, 2017, Hurricane Maria landed in Puerto Rico and it took us by surprise without gasoline, food, resources, or emergency plan. Maria arrived with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour, almost a category five storm. Everything began to get dark. The cell service stopped working and I quickly lost track of time. The last thing we knew through Facebook was that the rivers were overflowing and that people were calling for help. And this was the last time I had cell service for over a month. That day I couldn't stop walking around the apartment and I'd go out to the balcony protected by the stormproof windows and look through them trying to find a small glimpse of the magnitude of the disaster, but nothing in front of me could point me to the slightest indication of the catastrophic damages around the corners of the island. That day, time went by so fast and so slow. <laughs> the ambiance was brown and green, the rain never stopped, and the stop sign on the street below had fallen, and with each wind gust, it would drag its metallic sound through the whole street. The memories of September 20th, 2017 arrived fractured. In psychology, it is theorized that traumatic memory exists fragmented in pieces. It is stored in the senses that lives in the physical body. Back pain, tense knees, upset stomach, they all advise us of traumas that are alive and urged to be resolved. 24 hours later, the Hurricane Maria crisis had only just begun. The aftermath was the real catastrophe. And nowadays we still continue to feel this aftermath. It has now been three years later and there's still over 2,700 houses that need rebuilding. And Puerto Rico is a very small island, so 27,000 houses is a lot. <laughs> 
the next day it was warm the mosquitoes would unapologetically suck your blood and there wasn't a repellent strong enough to stop them i went out for a walk and stumbled upon pieces of zinc blood, electric cables, glass windows, and more. But we had to head back early because there was curfew. On my way back that day, I walked through the University of Puerto Rico, where I was studying at the time, and I found many trees on the floor. But what looked like fallen leaves were actually small parrots. They didn't find shelter before the storm. And after this, we lived many, many months without electricity. In my case, it was six months. The sounds of generators were like torture. And in the aftermath of Maria, there was never any silence. In the following months, food was rationed and we had to share it to make sure it, nothing was wasted. Some days we didn't have anything aside from crackers or a warm juice from the nearby gas station. We couldn't use the car because the lines to get gasoline were of minimum eight hours. So you had to stand eight hours under the sun or in your car, wasting the, the small amount of gasoline that we had. Whenever we would leave the house, our hope was to return and find the power back on, but it never happened. I moved a total of three times in the year following the hurricane. And as soon as some signal came back, we would go every day to the nearby fast foods to look at social media and to learn more about what was happening around the island. A lot of organizations, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> wanted to send help. Others posted pictures in brigades, others shared posts of their lost loved ones and many foreign journalists had front pages on international publications reporting on the disaster of Maria. I learned to hate the word resilience. I hate it. Resilience is not sustainable long-term. It is just a survival mechanism with a fixed end. While the country was devastated, and because the country was devastated, my father and I began to experience a crippling depression. We visited psychologists and psychiatrists. We became accomplices in our depression, exchanging really frightening emotions and thoughts. But while I healed, he continued struggling. And on July 11, 2018, I received a call and they told me that my father had died by suicide. This was just 10 months after the hurricane. A few days later, it was his funeral and I couldn't believe anything that was happening. The memories of that time are still so surreal. And I remember that on the street, I would find men that looked like him and I confused shadows with people, and his vestiges were everywhere. I'd hear his favorite music in the coffee shop. I'd see people wearing his shirt and shoes. I smell his perfume on the street. And I thought that people were lying to me or that the world was conspiring against me. He was out there somewhere. Like he couldn't just have left like that. until I received a box full of his belongings. And I learned then that there was no way of turning back. And it is here where this project is born, from the gut, from the worst pace, pain I've ever experienced in my life and from the grief for my father and my country. My father's death was also like a slap in the face. I saw myself reflected in his reality. And up until that moment, it was hard for me to admit that I too had been suicidal at that time. 
it was hard for me to admit that the country's conditions post Hurricane Maria had brought to light a long, deep depression that I had been carrying since my teens. The stages of grief were very complex. How do you simultaneously grieve a country and a father? And with him gone, I started by looking through the archive. It was the most obvious form of getting access to my father. And in the melancholic spiral of looking to find the living piece of him and wanting to bring the past to the present, I started intervening these images, threading them, collaging them, looking for connections, sometimes very literal connections, like pointing eyes and nose, fingers of the same hands. And at this stage, I idealized my father. I couldn't permit myself any anger or bad thought since he wasn't here to answer my claims. I lived many, many months denying the complex emotions I was feeling and I repressed them so not to think anything bad of my father. So stitching, collaging, and intervening these images became my way of documenting what I was feeling, of creating new understandings for these emotions, and of making my memories tangible through the use of objects. At this stage of my grief, he was like a divine creature. I dehumanized them so to not face myself until they provoked me to write. They told me, Gabby, there's so much inside you you're not letting out. Like, why don't you write your father a letter? I thought it was a silly exercise. Well, not really. I, I never thought it was a silly exercise. I didn't want to do it because I knew how much I was going to suffer. <laughs> I had to dive deep into very challenging emotions and memories in order to access other parts of my grief. So it was through this exercise, this catharsis of words that I was able to access deeper healing. And I was able to find the humanity of my father in the many questions that I had for him. Open quote. <clears throat> open letter to my father, to me, to the sea, to my suffering body, to the heaviness of the weak, to loss, to suicide. I don't know, maybe all of them or none of them. Maybe this is a catharsis. Maybe I'm starting by asking stupid questions to avoid having a challenging conversation with myself a conversation that only my deepest thoughts have witnessed, a conversation that could make anyone cry. With all the stumbling around, I forgot where I was going, but I know that these questions that I'm asking have something to do with wanting answers from the dead." End quote. So what I just read was the first piece of over now 100 pages of text. And they were right. I had so much inside me that I hadn't let out. And today I can only share with you some small passages, but know that in this project, journaling and being vulnerable, giving myself the opportunity to be vulnerable with my, myself was just as important as the image making. In fact, I would say that the exercise of writing and looking deep into myself was, was what allowed me to make new images. Because before I had just been stuck in the past in going back to the archive images. And so as we go through the next images, I'll be reading some of these short passages and just know that most of them are questions without answers or short reflections that have no solution.
The sea was your escape, your refuge. You've always been from the sea, the in-between. I remember observing you on the horizon and asking myself if you were scared. But now I'm asking myself, what were your thoughts observing me on the land, your reality? And if you were afraid of coming back to it. In geography, it is theorized that we learn by categorization. In psychology, they tell us that we're a construction of what surrounds us. But what happens to those things that escape science, language, categories, and limits? What happens to everything that doesn't fit in theory? Those things that have no words. After your death, family members would tell me they dream of you. I remember feeling jealous. Why didn't you appear in my dreams? A time came when I finally dreamt of you, but it was never a frontal image. Instead, it was like a shadow or a silhouette. But was it really you or my foolish hope in wanting to find you somewhere, even in my unconscious? I've looked for answers for many of these questions. I've looked for answers, not of why you left, but of the things we were never able to resolve. Where do I even start? I had planned to visit a medium to ask you questions, but again, I don't know where to begin. I don't know if I want someone in, our, in between us again. There's always been people in between us, perhaps to protect us from ourselves, protect us from the natural resentment of you being my father and of me being your daughter, of you not knowing how to raise a soul that wants to be free, and I not understanding that you were seeking to protect me from a world that has no patience, that is cruel, that is violent. Your shadow, your vestiges in the faces of strangers, they invite me to look for you, trying to revive your presence as soon as it fades. Everything is dark. I think I'm dead. I see my body from the outside. My whole body is fractured, broken into pieces. I cry and scream, resisting the most horrible sensations of my life, realizing that my suicide attempt had failed and realizing that I was dreaming. I wake up with a gasp and since then, I have the same pain beyond my dream. My dreams feel too real sometimes. My country is a liminal space a struggle between being and not being, the battle of being between two planes, the endless unattainable search, the space without answers, how to exist in such chaotic conditions. I feel heavy, I get tired, I'm exhausted sometimes. I don't have answers. I often question why I'm suffering. Is it because you're dead or is it because I live in your grave? I now tattoo grief on my chest. I dive in and think, hopefully we'll meet at sea.
creo que la vida y su abismo te dio una razón. El huracán María te dio una soga y ahora Puerto Rico es tu tumba. Recuerdo cómo nos mataron, cómo se robaron nuestro dinero, cómo dejaron nuestros recursos pudrirse, cómo se burlaron de nuestros muertos, incluyendo a mi pai, cómo nos impusieron toque de queda y cómo nos dejaron sin luz, sin comida, sin agua y luego nos culparon a nosotros. Tantas preguntas flotando en el abismo de la vida, como mi isla, siempre dando la impresión de que está a punto de ahogarse, como yo. Con cada crisis que sobrevivo en esta isla tumba, cada vez que la observo colapsar y pudrirse, trato de entenderme en medio de todo esto como parte de eso. As these stages go by, I start over from scratch, constantly finding myself in a spiral with new griefs to face, with the complex emotions and feelings occurring all on simultaneous planes. And although this chapter, this project is about to end, the depression, the death of my father and the aftermath of the hurricane will continue to accompany and inspire my creative work until the end of my days. And so I wanted to keep the presentation short so that we could chat and talk about what you guys were thinking, any questions you had. But first of all, I wanted to thank you all for allowing me to share this story with you, for joining me. I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity and thank you again, Joe and the Harvard Westlake School for the invitation. And so I'm happy to start chatting, start answering questions. Um, I don't know how, how Joe, you wanna do this, but if students want to open up their mic and ask the question directly or through the chat, I'm open to both of them. And also, if at any time you'd like to go back in the presentation, just feel free to tell me what you'd like to see again, and we could go back. Okay, so everyone, the chat's open. If you had questions, you can go ahead and place it in there. Um, I did get a couple while you were speaking. And one of the questions was, what did you, be, what did you mean making memories tangible through objects? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it's really abstract to, to talk about really complex feelings like grief. And so my way of processing them or making them more um, manageable was to turn them into an object. So while I can't necessarily make depression an object, I can make an interpretation of depression into an object. And that's what I wanted to do with these kinds of, of images. So put in there all the complex feelings of grief, of feeling angry with my country, feeling angry with my father, feeling angry at myself, um, and wanting to make that into something that I could literally touch and feel so that in another time, when I'm looking back at it, I can touch it and I can feel again what I was feeling at that time. Um, the next question is, how were you able to overcome this depression and did photography become an escape for you or a tool to help you work through it? Mm -hmm. So thankfully I have access to mental health resources. Definitely photography was a tool that allowed me to process a lot of what I was feeling as well as journaling and writing. Um, but it was a combination of photo-based work, writing and therapy that really allowed me to 
heal the wounds that I had that provoked that depression. And it is still a constant battle. You know, um, I don't feel like depression is a disease that you have. Instead, it's an experience. A, something you experience and at times you can experience it more intensely while at others you can experience it less intensely and so this project definitely helped me to m turn my emotions memories into images like something that I could process visually um, so I would definitely say that focusing my energies on this project and turning this really complex history of my father's death and, and the struggle of my country into a narrative, into a story that I could share with others was definitely a tool for healing. And the next question is, what lesson, if there is one, do you want us to get out of your project? Do you want us to take from your work? Um, that's a really good question and honestly something I hadn't thought of before. I would like the audience or people looking at this project to just see the humanity in the experiences of people like my father. You know, it, he's not just a number, a casualty in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Instead, he had a story. I had a story and that story is important. So I think that through this project, I want to shed light on the struggles of people having mental health challenges, as well as humanizing people that die in the aftermath of, her, of catastrophic, of natural disasters and catastrophes. Um, another question that came up in the private chat was, why did you use self-portraits and do you consider it to be documentary photography? Do you consider it to be a document? Mm -hmm. um, so at first I didn't think I was going to use self-portraits. Instead, I saw any images of myself coming from the archive. But as this project went developing and I started understanding my process of grief and, and my relationship with my father, I realized that Aside from being a story of my father's suicide, it was a story of, of me, of how I'm living in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and the aftermath of his, of his suicide. Like, how am I carrying those memories with me? So it made sense to start looking at myself more directly and pointing the camera at myself. And while this may not be considered traditional documentary photography, I definitely consider it a document. This is like a historical and truthful account of my father's death and of my experience grieving my father's death in the aftermath of the hurricane. And it precisely can't look like traditional documentary photography because mental health and suicide are very abstract topics. I mean, depression and mental health are abstract uh, topics and experiences. So you can't really, I mean, in, in my perspective, right? You can't really photograph um, depression. You have to photograph an interpretation of it or uh, a manifestation of it. So I think this was my way of doing it. And I definitely consider it <laughs> documentary photography. I think the field is also expanding to include more mixed media projects into the field of documentary. Have you, the next question is, have you noticed the styles and methods you learned used in this project carry over into other projects? And if so, how? Um, you mean like someone felt inspired by the work and then did something similar? I don't, it, I think what they're saying is the methodology such as self-portraiture and layering images um, that you used in this project, are you seeing it carry over into other things that you do now? Oh, okay, yes, yes. So I do have other personal projects that deal with 
depression <laughs> or like more abstract topics aside from my father's suicide. So I have another project that's focused more around the relationship between depression and sexuality. And I definitely carry this mixed media style into it. So this other project that I'm working on is with Polaroids, but on top of the Polaroids, there's sometimes stitching and there's sometimes a broken Polaroid or there's sometimes text on top of the Polaroid. So it's definitely something that I see myself continuing to do. It is so engraved in, in my style of, of creative work because most of my projects are some way or another autobiographical and I'm constantly like in a, journaling. I'm constantly like creating a diary and these works are my diaries. So I want them to look as close to a raw diary as they could. The next question is, was your family supportive with this project? Mm -hmm. So I had half of my family was supportive and the other half didn't want to participate. So the half that didn't want to participate was my stepmother and my younger brother on my, fam on my father's side. They were the ones closest to him um, when he died. So it made sense to me to, that they didn't want to be a part of it because it's still too, too close. It's still too raw for them. You know, they were living under the same roof. I wasn't, yeah, I was living by myself. And so they just asked me for space. They never told me you can't do it. They just didn't want to be included. And I think um, that is when I start looking at myself more um, through the camera, like using self-portraiture, because I realized that if I can't include my family in this narrative, I have to look more into myself and my experiences and my memories of my father. And then the other half that was supportive was my mom. <laughs> my mom is my number one fan. And so she was really um, helpful in, in encouraging me to put all these challenging emotions out there into the world and express them through my camera. Um, another question, it's kind of related to that, but... Um... They want to know how you were able to separate yourself during the making of the work, I guess, because it's such a, such a personal project, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I've ever separated myself from this work. I don't think it's possible. And I think that it's precisely that reason why it's taken me, it's taken me three years to get to this stage because I needed to take breaks because I needed to go to therapy. I needed to deal with this as slow as I could because I just can't separate myself from, from the work. Like when I, whenever I read what I wrote at one time, I get really emotional. Um, I look at some of these images and you know I feel like a pain on my chest because it's, it's my father, it's my, experiences of these last three years that have been extremely challenging and traumatic. So I can't separate myself from the work in that sense, but when, when working with editors or with mentors, I do have to put up some kind of barrier because any kind of criticism could be very challenging to receive in a project like this. Um, but that's where I, I do in, intend to put some distance and like, okay, that's your opinion and I will honor it and listen to it and consider it. But th these are my experiences and only I can communicate what they are. Um, the next question is, can you talk about Homeland and how your relationship to Puerto Rico has changed post Maria and after your father's passing. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how you mentioned the word resilience and how that is not a sustainable state. Mm -hmm. um, so Puerto Rico, to give a little bit more context, has been in crisis since 
I would say 2008 since the financial crash, but it's been more heavily felt since 2016. So that year, a $73 billion debt was declared on the island. And as a colonial territory of the United States, Puerto Rico can't apply for bankruptcy. So the next best thing that was created under the Obama administration was a fiscal control board. So this fiscal control board is basically a group of bondholders and economists, businessmen that organize and take decisions of uh, over the finance, take over the financial decisions of Puerto Rico in order to pay back that debt. So we're paying at the cost of educational resources, transportation, housing, health. We're using all those funds that are being cut from those essential services to pay back bondholders and hedge funds. So what that means is that living in Puerto Rico has become extremely challenging since 2016. And the hurricane was just like exacerbated all of that because it literally destroyed the island. Like buildings went down, water like flooded everywhere. So many houses were destroyed. The power lines were out for over a year. It just made the physical conditions of the island be almost unrepairable. And so in the aftermath of the hurricane, corruption and the fiscal control board's decisions to continue to attend uh, the debt, like pay back bondholders and hedge funds went before the lives of Puerto Ricans. So literally a lot of people on the island died because their resources weren't available because they had to be channeled so that they could pay back bondholders and hedge funds. And so it is those conditions, like the decisions of the government that intentionally left people to die that make the relationship with Puerto Rico extremely challenging and traumatic. So an island already in crisis gets a natural disaster and is just further plummeted into crisis. And so really the, the relationship with Puerto Rico is just of survival, of constant hustling, of constant moving around to try to get any kind of resources so that I don't have to leave the island. You know, I don't wanna leave Puerto Rico for a job opportunity. I mean, I would, <laughs> but what I mean is that I want to, I want Puerto Rico to be my base. I want to, I want this country to go forward. That's like my intention with my work, but the living conditions make it so hard to stay here. So it's a constant like struggle for survival. And that's where resilience come in, comes in. Like the news organizations and publications always talk about Puerto Rican resilience, which is basically survival, is the strategy of looking for survival. But looking for survival is traumatic. It's draining. It's not sustainable long term. Like people need to live a healthy, comfortable life in order to come up with um, creative projects, come up with um, innovating things. I don't know. Like survival is is literally just that, like trying to get by day by day. And so um, one of the books that really helped me during this time was The Body Keeps the Score by a, a psychologist called Bessel, Bessel van der Kolk. And in this book, he talks about how literally survival is traumatic. Like looking for constant survival is traumatic because we need rest. We need help we need to feel okay in order to heal and live a healthy life. And I think that answered that question. <laughs> I'm gonna combine these last two questions. Um, what is your advice for students who are struggling with mental health 
And what is your advice to students who are starting out a documentary project about place, about self, about things, or about community? Mm -hmm. So first of all, I would say that please consider looking into um, any kind of mental health resources available in your school, in your community, um, in your state and try everything. So literally like if there's a yoga class that you never thought you'd like yoga, but you why not give it a try because someone said it's good for your mental health, just do it. You never know if it's something that might actually work for you. So those are the things that I would say, look for professional help, find books that um, talk about what you're experiencing, uh, talk with a friend, um, journal, ask yourself very challenging questions and work with the answers that you have within yourself. And in my case, it really helps me to move my body. So I mentioned yoga because <laughs> yoga actually helps me, but dancing, swimming, going out for a walk, um, maybe taking an exercise class or something could be activities that stimulate your body and mind and can help you access health, not just physical health, but mental health. There is a very strong connection between mind and body. And so when we work on one, we'll consequently work on the other one. And so what I would say for students starting out the project about place, identity, and self, it's kind of in the same vein. Like if you're journaling, don't be afraid to wonder deep inside yourself. Like what are the things that you're not, you don't want to ask yourself because you're afraid of what might come out. Like what are the things that you're hiding from yourself? I think that's a really strong place to start asking questions. And I would also suggest looking into the archive. Um, even though you've seen the family album many, many times, you never know what could come up when you're intentioning a project. So look for images that, that call you, look for images that you feel a relation to, or ones that you have no idea what they mean. Like maybe there is a good start for questions. If you have a good relationship with family members, feel free to ask them questions and um, ask them to tell you their own story, their struggles. Maybe they have a journal they're willing to share with you and you could learn more about their experiences. And when talking about identity, like self-identity, it's a good exercise to point the camera to yourself, even though if in the end you don't decide to use any self-portraiture. The exercise of sitting down in front of a camera can really help you to learn how, what's your relationship with the camera and how you can shift that relationship with others. I think those are my suggestions. And if, if anyone else wants to like reach out to me or ask me further questions, if we're running out of time or something, like please feel free to write down my information and we can talk about it more. Gabriela, we did go over, 